I'd like to think that everyone in our office feels like they matter and they're heard. Business of Architecture, episode 378. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I'm speaking with David Coteau, who serves as the president and principal of Flansburg Architects. Now, David has over 35 years of experience managing, planning, and designing projects throughout the US, and he has worked internationally in over 30 different countries. David directs efforts to extend Flansburg's geographic reach and its capacity to deliver contemporary, culturally sensitive projects in a wide range of environmental conditions. He also specializes in public, private and international arts and into educational institutions. And for each project, David combines a very strong commitment to sustainability, design, innovation, authenticity and craft with the careful attention to all of his clients. And in this interview, I talk with David about his career trajectory, how he became the president and principal of Flansburg's Architects. We talk about how the business has been growing and how they have been extending their reach and how they win work and how they market themselves. So sit back, relax and enjoy David Croteau. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, Please follow the link in the information. David, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? Good, Rian. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Now, you are the president and principal of Flansburg Architects. Um, you've been there for uh, quite, a, quite a, a long part of your, your career. Um, you've got expertise in managing, planning, designing projects all throughout the, the US. You've worked internationally. And I suppose the first, the first question is, how, what, what has been your career trajectory in becoming president principal of the business? Uh, yes, well, I arrived at Plansburg in 1987 after working at another small firm for a year after graduating from uh, Rensselaer. Uh, and I spent 13 years here at Plansburg. And I, then I, I left and became a senior associate. I then left and joined another firm for five years and then mm. Return. So I've been back at this office for about 15 years. How would you describe the role of being the principal? One of the things I love about architecture is the fact that, um, is that as a principal or even as an architect, you do a little bit of everything. So yeah. um, the design of a project, there's um, how do you do that profitably? So how do you, how do you design a project and make money on it? Um, how do you... Uh, design a project within the owner's uh, project budget. How do you get the project and how do you manage a team? Yes. Um, and one of the things that in my role as a principal is that I enjoy doing everything about architecture and what our firm is about 25 people. And one of the things that's great about that is that as a firm, we have the ability to do quite small projects. Um, I would say small is anywhere from, you know, two to 5 million, mm. but then also quite large projects over a hundred million. And um, I'm involved in, in, in just about all those projects. And on the one hand, I'll be working at getting projects. On the other hand, I'll be building models, you know, uh, physical models, uh, either getting work or as we're talking with clients. So, um, and we've structured the office. So just about everyone does that. So our office is structured where it's not so much about a, a hierarchy of, mm. um, you know, principal, project manager, project architect, and so forth, because because I like all aspects of, of practice, the practice of architecture, um, we make a real effort that everyone uh, has that same experience. So in other words, we don't have someone who's just a designer and someone who just does construction administration, someone who just does management. Typically, uh, an architect in our office handles all of those things. They'll meet with a client, they'll take a project from design through construction and handle all aspects of the practice. And so it's more a group of, of like-minded architects than it is um, and well-rounded architects than yeah. it is a group of, um, you know, specialists in different, in different categories. So 
I like to think that my role as a principal is not that dissimilar from everyone's role uh, in the office. How, how did, well, you were saying earlier that you've, you've been, at the, been with the company since 1989. Um, how, how did you get to be in the position of becoming principal? Was that a kind of clear career path that you had envisioned from the beginning or was it much more organic? In terms of starting a practice, I saw that as quite challenging. Yeah. Um, you know, I have a family, I have three children and, um, and I saw that quite honestly, I wasn't ready to really take that risk. Mm. Um, and after leaving the office and then coming back, there was the opportunity, um, to, uh, kind of gain ownership of the office through, um, through, through the work of the office, through the profits of the office. And so I think that I saw that, um, as a real opportunity to gain, um, you know, to gain the kind of independence of work that I was really seeking. So I think probably like many architects who, who, uh, who head into, head into architecture school, leave thinking they're going to start a practice. And that was my initial thinking as well. Um, but actually saw the return to Flansburg as an opportunity to assume control of an office. Um, you had a lot of the respect from, I had a lot of respect uh, of the people in the office when I left. And then when I came back, I had gained a tremendous amount of experience at another office. So I'd always imagined that I would be running an office. Uh, the path to get where I am, I had not obviously mapped that out you know, when I yeah. graduated from, from college, but kind of saw it as, a, uh, you know, as, as this opportunity when I, when I returned. So, um, yeah. What, what was it that had you leave and then come back? Because that's, that's always a very interesting career trajectory yeah. as, as well, because some, sometimes you can, yeah. you can surge in a career and learn a whole lot of really unusual, unique experiences. Yeah. And, but then to come back yeah. is, it must be something quite special. Yeah. So I think, um, uh, you know, the firm uh, for the first 13 years I was here, the firm changed. I went through a transition of ownership. And um, so it actually became a firm that was different than the one I joined 13 years earlier. Right. And um, I wasn't pleased with that, that where it was headed in some ways. I thought it was losing its design um, focus. And also uh, it was too focused on one particular, one particular sector uh, in terms of, in mm. terms of the design. So um, I, you know, probably, and I was at that time, I was, um, I think I was 37. I think at that time when I left and uh, anyone who's been 37 or will reach 37, it's a time when you really begin to rethink where you're headed. And it was to me an opportunity to say, if I'm going to make a change, I need to do it now. Right. And then, you know, five years after that, I kind of saw that the firm that had left um, was struggling. It went, you know, uh, it went from, I think, 100 down to 35. In five years right. Wow. On. And um so then that five years later, I saw that there was an opportunity to, to actually, if I rejoined, to change the direction of the firm in a way that I wanted to take it. Um, and the experience that I gained at this other office would allow me to do that. Um, and in fact, just seeing a different way of, of how to run an office. And mm. I like to think that, um, I mean, we all probably have mentors and um, so I've probably had three mentors who are vastly different people. and um, you know, as you gain experience and you meet people, um, you know, they can guide you. And I feel like I've kind of with those mentors combined aspects of each one of them um, to help, you know, in, in some ways guide me in the way that I, in the way that I manage the practice. So, so when, upon your return back to Flansburg, what were yeah. some of the, did you go straight into the principal role or was there a kind of, you join, you rejoined the practice and then, it was again a more of an I re evolution. I rejoined the practice. Yeah, I rejoined the practice with a small bit of ownership, and then okay. over time, each of the other principals retired, and my ownership increased. Basically, and Got through it. that time, you know, gained more and more uh, control of the office. So it was a, uh, it was a, uh, and that was somewhat planned. You know, when I returned, the uh, the uh, the three principals when I returned were all um, in their, I think, all in their sixties. So. Right. It was an opportunity where you could see that they were looking for they were you know they were looking for that kind of transition um i mean the firm has done well in terms of transitions often sometimes that can be difficult but mm. um you know I, I i knew the principals quite well they were friends and um you know that 
uh, that transition actually went very smoothly. How old is the office, like originally when Earl Flansburg set it up? How, well, coincidentally, the office was, was founded the same year I was born, <laughs> so, which was 1963. So uh, what is that? It's 50, uh, what is that, 57, 58 years old? Yeah. So, yeah, you know that. It's my age. So um, yeah, so it's like 57, 58 years old. Right. Okay. Got it. And so, and so prior to that, they kind of Earl and the principles that he had sort of set up, they had already gone through one transition successfully. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. So there had been, uh, Earl had started, there was one transition. And then when I returned, it was in the process of a, of a third transition of which, you know, I kind of, yeah. So I kind of became the third transition, if you will, through that, through about a five year process. And, and, and when a business is going through a transition like this, what are the kind of key elements that you look at to ensure that things are kind of kept intact? And then there's also a shedding process, if you like, of the old skin or the or kind of, you know, something that's making way for a, a new a new generation of leadership. What does what does that process look like? Yeah, I mean, I think for us, the key was continuity. Right. And um, so there was not there was not um, there was not a big announcement that the firm was transitioning. You know, it was each principal kind of we did stagger it. So uh, two of the principals could have retired the same year, but that would have been um, would have been financially difficult to do. So they just agreed to stagger their retirements in order to make the transition right. you know, um, more seamless. And also um, through transition, I mean, the way our structure is set up is that, um, you know, for those that retire, you know, the firm needs to stay successful because we have a deferred, deferred uh, um, uh, compensation plan. So it's in the interest of those that are transitioning out to make sure the firm can succeed because their, their interests are also tied to the, uh, tied to the success of the firm. Um, and, you know, these are people that I had known for 20 years. So mm -hmm. I, I think that, the other thing that was helpful is that there was a lot of trust, um, you know, uh, amongst all the, all the, the parties during that transition, um, uh, of real comfort with one another. So it wasn't that, um, uh, you know, it was by no means hostile. No one felt they were getting forced out. There was none of, there was none of that. It was all very organic and, you know, so uh, well, it's not a lot of drama. Great. In, in terms of, you know, when a, a business has got that kind of history to it, if you like, a long, a long standing history, has yeah. the prop, have the kind of project typologies shifted and changed very much? Or have you been, you know, you know, you've, you've got a lot of work in institutional work, in public work, in yeah. schools, education, has that always been yeah. the kind of key sorts of type uh, building typologies that you've worked on? Or has, has there been quite a you know, a diversification of portfolio that's emerged? Yeah, I would say that that's been, um, I mean, you asked me at the outset that the kind of, well, in some ways, the history of the firm. So Earl Flansburg um, uh, was at TAC, you know, the Architects Collaborative. And their approach, of course, was um, uh, one of, of a broad range of design. So when, when I arrived at the firm in 1987, um, it offered landscape architecture, graphic design, interior design, planning, and architecture. So, you know, a, a group of, of like-minded designers but beyond architecture. And also uh, Earl's goal was to do a whole range of types of projects. So we were doing interiors for law offices while we were also doing public parks, um, you know, housing, um, public schools, um, so forth. So a range of types of projects. As I mentioned before, you know, the direction changed to the point where um, in, in the transition, those other disciplines were shed right. and there was a focus purely on public education, on public, on public schools. Um, and so, and that's around the time that I left because <laughs> there was this other, there was this other shift. So um, uh, I would, so so coming around to, and I have friends who have started their own offices, and I would say, kind of to your point, one of the challenges of having a firm that is known that when I came back was known for doing public schools, it's good in a way in that you, you, already, you already have established a reputation, but it's also bad in a way in that it's very difficult to head into other 
types of work because you're thought of as that type of firm. Right. Right. So, um, whereas if you're starting a firm and you're just going after everything, um, you know, maybe over time you begin to be successful in one sector, but, um, in some ways there's a lot of freedom in terms of what you can do, because like I mentioned with the blank point, nothing's been stamped yet. Right. Yeah. So you can kind of head in any direction. So, well, well, assuming control of a firm already has a reputation and a, and a revenue stream yeah. has its advantages, it also has these disadvantages because it's difficult. It's actually in some ways more difficult um, to head into other to head into other areas. Mm. So, um, our strategy in terms of my return, our strategy has been to um, to look at K to twelve education as a platform to move to other types of projects. So. In K to 12 education, you do just about every project type. Um, you know, it includes, especially if you're into, um, as we are, um, you develop independent education. So private schools essentially around the country. Right. Uh, and then international education, which are schools, you know, around the world. Uh, so what we decided to do would be to, um, within that sector of K to 12 education, would be to broaden our geographical reach and also broaden our, our client types within that, within that, um, uh, within that type. And, um, and also put a focus, I mentioned the, the collaboration with local artists here in Boston, but also put a focus on from there to move into um, arts and culture, mm. because many of those institutions uh, have educational programs, often K-12 educational programs. So, um, you know, so we're working with, you know, uh, Jacob's Pillow, in um, uh, which I think you've probably seen our studio there, and also uh, Trinity Rep in in Providence, which are cultural institutions that have both have educational programs that have developed out of our K to twelve. So, um, so anyway, in returning to the office is to take our expertise in K to twelve and look at ways of how that could apply as broadly as possible. So, um, you know we've done you know separate aquatic centers the project we did in hawaii which is a science center which was uh you know the third building to reach a full living building certification mm -hmm. um, both those were for k-12 schools but in fact quite um quite interesting and and in the case of the hawaii project um uh i mean that was in 2010 we had mm -hmm. a living building so um those clients are can often be um you know, very forward thinking. Uh, so, got it. So, I think that's been that's been kind of the strategy: is how do we broaden, how do we broaden that sector as much as possible? That, that's really interesting. It's kind of so. It's kind of you've gone deeper into the niche, if you like, or the specialism, that's and right. actually, actually, by going deeper into it, it's actually a lot. It's actually broader than you might have imagined, because it's that's it's right. got, it's got these kind of sub typologies which are linked quite intimately to other institutional work, but you're able to bring a very right. um, localized specialism to those. Yeah. I mean, the other thing, the other thing, um, you know, if you have a reputation for being doing public schools in Massachusetts, how do you begin to change that? And if you're also a firm, it is doing, um, you know, international schools in, in Lebanon or in, um, know in south africa uh, right now we have a project in brussels you know for example um and in in zoo in in switzerland um it begins to change the image of the office into something that is um still within that sector but um a much different uh a much different look um how how a lot of those these kinds of projects with schools education institution projects the mechanisms for winning the work, if you like, are protracted, they're quite complex, they're not easy uh, always, and particularly if you're not working with um, private institutions. Um, could you walk us through a little bit about how do, you, how do you win those types of projects? What's the process? Do you go out proactively and make connections with people, or is it referral based or is it competitions or response? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so it's three different, it's actually three different ways for those three broad sectors of public education in Massachusetts, independent schools around the country and international right. schools around the world. So each of those are approached differently actually. So, um, but, and ironically, those three, uh, um, educational groups don't really speak to each other. 
So they're actually pretty separate. Right. Which you wouldn't, think, but they, they don't really. Um, uh, so there's a, there's a whole public um, process in Massachusetts that, um, and there's probably a dozen firms in Massachusetts that we compete against regularly for public school projects, but it's, it's a quite, um, you know, fair and transparent process. Um, it's, and it's administered by Massachusetts. Um, mm -hmm. They do a pretty good job of making sure that work is pretty evenly distributed amongst firms. They don't want to overwhelm, overwhelm one firm. It's all public notice. So that's simply, um, you know, we're strategic about the projects we go after. You know, we, um, we do everything we can to make sure that every project we do is successful. Mm -hmm. And um, because once, once it's not, you know, um, that could impact our, our work in Massachusetts. So that's just being, um, you know, smart and capable. Uh, and you're up against, we're up against very talented firms, a lot of firms like us. So um, uh, you, you really have to be sharp. On the um, on independent schools, um, that is a greater word of mouth. And I think that one of the things that we, that we do is we have many independent schools who have been working on the campuses for 10 years. Mm. So, um, you know, the, uh, the theater that we did for Seabury Hall, which is a school in, um, on Maui, uh, about, it was, it was seven years, I think, after a, a, a classroom building we had done for them. And we're working for another independent school now where the first project we did for them was 12 years ago. So, um, you know, I think on the, on the independent schools, it's, it's largely about, um, you know, it's much more word of mouth and, and, you know, making sure that, that again, um, you're developing strong relationships internationally. It's uh, remarkable how tight knit that group is, even though, um, uh, schools are spread across the, across the globe. Hmm. Um, it, it's actually, there's a lot of transition between, between heads of school and, um, administrators and the like, so they move around quite a bit. So if we develop a relationship with one and they move somewhere else, we end up, we end up somewhere else. So, um, you know, if we do, so, you know, we did a project in, um, we did a project in Addis and, um, and then that led to a project in India. So we're doing a project now in New Delhi. So it's, it seems that they're, they're not connected, but they are, but it's, it's people. I mean, I find that it's hard, particularly now, um, to make those connections, but hmm. I think that largely our strategy is just develop, you know, strong relationships with people. Um, how, and, how, uh, how do you do that? How do you kind of uh, cultivate long lasting, successful and powerful relationships with clients that, that will lead to referrals or lead to them talking positively about you? If you I like. don't know. I mean, I think that, uh, well, it's a, probably a series of things, right? I think that uh, one is, uh, I think that we're really passionate about about um, our projects. And, um, you know, I think that um, passion and sincerity, well, passion, sincerity, and creativity. You mm -hmm. know, I think that, um, you know, I think a lot of clients appreciate that. I always was struck by, uh, there was a, um, documentary on Frank Lloyd Wright years ago, and it was a two part series on PBS or something. And, um, Johnson of, of the Johnson wax company was quoted as saying he didn't even know if he liked Frank Lloyd Wright's buildings, but he just loved working with the guy. Mm. And it was more about the experience of working with Frank Lloyd Wright than it was actually his buildings. Yeah. Um, I think we take that seriously. I think that there's, um, you know, our view is not that um, we're trying to build our building, you know, we're trying to build our clients building. And I think that respect for their ideas and their input and the communication so that the experience of working with us is as rewarding as the, as the building that they end up with. So um, I think that's, um, I think that probably goes a long way to developing, developing lasting relationships. Mm. Um, yeah. With, the educational clients, both the kind of international independent schools and the public public work, how do you align yourselves with those clients' business agendas? 
for example, that they have for the buildings? Yeah, it differs a little bit. I mean, I think on public schools, there's an agenda there in a way is that you're serving an entire town. Right. Right. I mean, in Massachusetts, in order for a town to build a school, they have to vote to raise their own taxes. <laughs> and so it's very much a community effort. Right. And, um, you know, the interest there are really in, um, you know, in, in many ways, it's a community service about how can we create a building that's going to serve that community well so that, and, and do it economically, you know, both build it economically, but then also create a project that is going to operationally be efficient because it has to serve this town for, for you know, the next 50 years. Many of the projects we're doing now are replacing school buildings that are 50 years old. Mm -hmm. So I think that on the public side, there isn't so much a business agenda per se, is that um, each decision you made needs to be really founded in something that is of value, of value to community. So there isn't, I think, you know, an opportunity there for a lot of, um, in terms of the business agenda, for a lot of um, um, uh, extra, you know, so something that isn't really needed, that isn't essential, you know, to that, to that yeah. overriding um, goal of, of, you know, educating children. It's very similar on... Um, on the independent schools as well, on those, many independent schools don't have the resources of public schools. Often, you know, there are, there are donors um, that are, you know, making great sacrifices in order to give money to, to a school. And often in independent schools, the building they're doing is they're probably not going to do another building for another, you know, the schools we work for, um, you know, they're not going to do another building for 10 or 20 years. And it's a major, you know, um, it's a major impact on their campus and their community. And, um, you know, being mindful of that, the importance that it plays in their community, um, again, you know, to, is that to, to focus on what is, what is the thing that's going to build as much consensus in that community that people are going to be excited about, but also that they can afford, yeah. um, I think is, is really critical on the, on the, in, on the international school side. Um, they have a lot of the same, um, they have a lot of similarities relative to raising money, but um, it's, it's a different culture in the transition that happens in international schools. So there, one needs to be mindful that whatever, whatever we do, um, it, often we do master plans for international schools that are looking, their, their enrollment swings quite a bit. And, um, you know, there the challenge is how do you do something that is on the one hand doesn't foreclose a whole set of opportunities that they might have in the future, you know, and on the other hand meets their, their current need, um, but to be careful that they aren't over-investing. Like we worked in, the, in, the, in Kinshasa in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and um, they at one point, that campus had built a building and there was, there was a political uprising and their enrollment dropped dramatically. So... With international schools, there's a different strategy in a way, just because things are often in things are often in, in flux. So, so in terms of their business plan, is how do you create something that allows for for a great deal of of flexibility? Right. So yeah. So different strategies for those three different different groups, but um, but all of our work is, I mean, you say business, but all of our work is either public or not for profit. Yeah. So one of the things that we really enjoy is that. Um, they, there's not really a business incentive per se, mm. you know, which is great about these types of clients is that most of them are focused on, um, how the student experience, um, is, uh, you know, how that can be improved or, you know, um, how that becomes, um, you know, what is it that distinguishes them from, in the case of independent schools, primarily how, how, do, how what distinguishes them from other independent schools. Mm. Public schools don't have competitors, really. And international schools are often the only international school, you know, in, in, a, in a city. Yeah. So um, often it's about how do we provide the best experience possible for our students that's the driver, not so much um, how are we going to make money on it. So, so it's, it's business, yes, but not, not in the sense of, um, not in the sense of, of um, kind of ruthless profits yeah. if you like it's yeah exactly exactly it's, 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 a, it's a very different um, it, right 
to, yeah. to the there's still business the goals per se, but it's different. Yeah. Yeah. Then then and they're not kind of using the buildings as financial instruments as such. That's right. They've got right. they've got a deeper it's a deeper, not really part of a business plan, right? Yeah. It's part of an education plan. How, what would what advice would you give to younger practices? Because obviously um education is one of these topics or one of these kind of sectors that many, many young practices are kind of really hungry to contribute to and to and to work in what advice would you give to a, a young practice starting out about how to get involved with doing the, this the kind of work that your portfolio is comprised of seeing seeing that as you, as you said already it's, it's very it's kind of very fierce competition yeah. and it's kind of and particularly nowadays it's more and more increasingly difficult if you haven't got experience in that sector it's very hard to get your foot in the door if you like yeah, well, um, maybe this is an analogy of uh, this way is that um, is that our our first international school project was in um, at International College in Beirut, and that came about through a connection of um, through through uh, um, through the spouse of one of our principals at another firm who knew someone in Beirut. Um, her father was a heart surgeon at this. And so one thing led to another, we got an interview and, and the combination of our two firms, their connection and our work in independent school, we got an international school in, in international college. That was in, I think, 2006. And we're just finishing up our third project there now. So we've been working, we've built this, um, two major buildings and this is a renovation of a third building. So developed a very long-term relationship. So it's 15 years that we've been mm. working on that campus, which was our first international school project. Um, so that came about through just a personal connection to get the first project. Our next, but then it took three years for us to get our next international school project. After. <laughs> right? And right. that project was that project was a a campus audit in um, Kinshasa in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, and I think it was a $15,000 fee. That was our next international school project. And on international schools, I, I kind of took the strategy that, um, you know, there's not a lot of firms that want to go to the DRC. Mm -hmm. And so we started off by just going to the places that other firms wouldn't want to go. Right. Right. So we didn't, like we're working in Brussels now, but we didn't start in Brussels. You know, we, we started in Kinshasa. And so, wow. um, and it's, so it's been a, uh, so in the, so we're now, I think when we, so that was in, I think 2010. Mm -hmm. So 10 years ago, we had one international school basically and an audit campus audit for one other one. And since then, we've done 25 international schools in 25 different countries. But it started out by starting out in a place, and again, making those connections, but starting out in a place no one would go. Right. So um, in some ways, I mean, we're still, we're, we're pursuing a project right now in, in Morocco. So we're still very interested in, and we have projects, um, one in construction right now in Senegal. Um, so we're still very interested in the continent. It's a fascinating mm -hmm. place to work. Um, but I would say that uh, our strategy has been not to not to go for the top projects to begin with because you don't have the experience for that, but to find either through a personal connection or you know places where fewer firms go to to begin. That's with. so interesting. That's really really interesting. What, was this a a kind of concerted? plan if you like or was it kind of you know you you're in the conversations and then you're kind of you know one no, it, was a plan. it was planned it was a plan yeah brilliant yeah it was kind of a plan i mean what we found was uh in this case it just had to do with um we went to a conference right met, met, a fellow, met a fellow from africa and um then uh I thought, well, I'm going to make a trip through Africa. And that's the other thing I would say is that, um, you know, uh, is that the, the first rule of improv is say yes. And so <laughs> we, we met this, we met this fellow and he said, well, um, you know, 
we're doing this classroom building. Would you, you know, would you want to submit a proposal? I said, sure. And the thing that we did, the other thing with internationally that helps, the thing we did is I flew to Africa. No, no one else did. Yeah. And, um, you know, I visited the campus. I visited, I spent a day in, I actually flew to Senegal for a day and back. Um, and I've wow. done that many times for internet. So I've, I've flown to uh, Angola and back in the day. I've flown to Nepal and, and, and back. Wow. So, um, <laughs> So I think the other lesson, the other lesson would be like, go there. Yeah. I mean, and the whole zoom thing has made it really difficult in terms of that as a business model, but mm-hmm. assuming that the things return and, um, you know, you wouldn't think to do that as a small firm to like, you know, go somewhere like that. But, um, you know, I think that would be the, that would be one of my suggestions is that, you know, just kind of have to just get out there. Really, mm. yeah. that, that that is yeah i mean that, that's a really interesting kind of business development strategy if you like and it kind of makes a lot of a lot of sense as you're, you're sort of looking at emerging markets looking looking for opportunities and being very proactive and and planning about okay well where is there where is there possibility and where is and where is everybody else not willing to go and if it means doing a day yeah. trip to angola then it means doing a day trip to angola that's right yeah. I mean, it can be intense, but I mean, the, you know, and, you know, even if you don't get a project, mm. right, you still meet the people and you have the experience. Yeah. Like, so it's not even that, you know, we didn't get the project in Senegal. I mean, since then that, I mean, that was, that was, uh, you know, 10 years ago. And now we're doing a project on the same campus, right. with different administration and so forth. And I'd already been to the campus, you know, but um, it, it's totally, it's actually not connected in any way. It's just that um, I went after a project in Brazil and um, met the head of school there. And he ended up becoming the head of school in Brussels. We didn't get the project in Brazil either, but um, flew there, met him, spent a day with him. Um, then we were asked to submit for another proposal in Brazil. Um, we didn't get that one either, but I met that head. He actually came. Uh, uh, to our office and met us and we came in second there. Um, but those two, those two projects became a reference for the project we did get in Brazil. In Brazil. So even though we didn't get those two projects, the connection we made through the process, through going after those projects was so strong that they served as a reference for, <laughs> because they knew us, you know? Brilliant. So, Brilliant. yeah. So I think going through, um, you know, just, process of getting work even if you don't get it leads to other work i would say so be a key key takeaway of that um in terms of the current business structure internally at flansburg what does the business look like so in terms of how many people are you roughly is it 25 you said 25 yeah 25 and does that kind of has that you said previously at one point you were 100 and it's it reduced down and is it kind of been stable at that size for a while and we've been we've been about this size uh since i returned to the office okay so it's been um and we don't we don't really um i think we had one layoff uh i think in you know around 2008 when the recession hit that was two people Mm -hmm. so and that's it and so um you know many of our most of our staff have been here for, you know, over 10, over, you know, 10, 15 years. So we, we've been able to maintain that size, um, Mm. which has been good because um, as I mentioned at the outset, in terms of how we're structured, um, you know, with that continuity um, and the fact that everyone kind of does everything uh, quality is kind of built in. Yeah. In a way. So if you don't have a lot of changeover of staff and you have staff that um, understand the, the practice of architecture from all angles, really, then um, it improves the it improves the quality, and also you have a lot of um, you know management is a lot easier because everyone's kind of on the same you know kind of on the same page in a way. Um, so I think that uh, so so kind of maintaining that size, and I also I think as I said at the outset, we it's funny we. Um, Sometimes we're, you know, if you talk with consultants, whether it's an attorney or someone, if you're looking into marketing, they say, well, what's your mode? Are you in growth mode? Right? Like, what's your strategy? And um, 
I've, I've never really thought about a growth mode. I think that, uh, you know, um, I like the size, as I said before, because I can be involved in everything. We can do projects of just about any size. And mm -hmm. also the connections we make with our clients are quite personal because we're all kind of intimately involved. Um, but um, I always look at it like, uh, you know, I just want to set up an opportunity where we're getting the kind of project I would want to have gotten assigned in architecture school. Yeah. So it's not about getting more projects, right? And it's not even about getting bigger projects. It's about getting the projects that you really want to do. So we tend to go after projects that we want to do, not ones that we have to do. Mm -hmm. And I think that's um, because, it, you know, why do it? <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, it's kind of like that's, I just want to, I always want to get the office in a position where we can get really interesting projects. Mm -hmm. right? So that's, that's not more, not less, but just like the kind of projects that you'd love to do. Yeah. Um, and, and in a situation where I can be involved in them. So I don't want to have, our office is not set up where I'm going out and getting all the work and other people are doing it. You know, I have other principals who get work and then we do the, we all kind of do the work. So it's because it's not, it's not, um, you know, it's not, uh, there's no kind of hierarchy. Got it. So, so business development is kind of spread amongst everybody. And actually is. one of the main drivers is having fulfilling work. Yeah. yeah. That's the driver. That the driver is to like do work that you want to do and be proud of it. Mm. That's, that's, you know, and also I think that the other thing is that um, kind of as a, as a recommendation would be that you really have to know who you are and be confident that the people who know who you are, there's enough of those people who know you are and like you for who you are to hire you. Because, um, you know, if you're changing who you are to work with someone, um, that may not be a very um, pleasant experience. So I like to think that, um, you know, we like our clients and they like us, you know? So it's, it's um, uh, so that's the other thing I would say is that we're, um, when you're going through the interview process and you really, if you can, if it's possible, depending on the process and the client, you know, if you can get, if, if you get to know each other, then it's a much better fit, you know, once you get the project. So, you know, I'm happy to say that we're really, I mean, we enjoy all of our clients, you know, which I think is also a thing, you know, you obviously you want to, you want to do work you love for clients that you, that you like. Right. Yeah. Um, so that's really, that's, that's really the goal. That's not a goal beyond that to grow, to get bigger or, you know, whatever, you know, it's, that's, that's basically the goal. <laughs> is that, is that, would you say one of the reasons why you think you have such a, a good kind of retention rate with team members and staff is because that, that well, culture is kind of embedded in the business. Yeah. I mean, I, I like to think that people, uh, I mean, I know when I was, when I was younger, I wanted to, have an impact on the projects. I mean, I wanted to, I wanted to know what was, I wanted to know everything that was happening. I wanted to be in the, you know, we tend to have all of our, as much as possible, have our junior staff in every meeting we have with the client so they can, because it also helps with the whole training. I mean, how can you make a design decision if you don't understand the full context? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, and often it can save on communication. The time that, that um, we spend in, in meetings talking directly to the client is time that we don't have to communicate whatever happened in the meeting to, you know, to the staff. And we also work um, quite collaboratively with our clients. So often we, um, uh, often we design, literally design with them. So as an example, uh, if we're doing a master plan for an international school, um, we build a physical model of the campus, which we bring with us to the, to the, to the campus. We have uh, model blocks that represent every, which can be hundreds that represent every space that would go on there, you know, in that campus. Mm -hmm. And we often arrive with just that. And we spend a week there. And by the end, we have a campus design. So we don't arrive with any plan of their campus. We just <laughs> simply work through it with them. Yeah. Right. So, um, it, you know, and then we have worked together and ended up with a design that everyone has had input on. And by everyone, I mean students, all the faculty, you know, the entire parents, I mean, families, the entire community, you know, and have and everyone in our office that's working on the project is there. 
right? So at the end, everyone kind of has a good sense about what the direction is. I like to think that everyone in our office feels like they matter and they're heard and they have what they're doing has a direct input on, you know, the project and, and office. So I just, I just think that's, that's important. Um, again, or else why do it? You know? mm. well, what are some of the, you know, when you're, when you're got projects in the, in the business, how do you make sure that they remain profitable and are kind of ticking all the, 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 the business boxes, if you like. So, uh, and, it, and in, and I, I, I like, I like the way that you've just described the, the process there of actually you're designing with the clients. And I can imagine actually that's probably a very efficient and effective way of managing. Well, yeah. Things I mean, well. You, you, well, I would say, I would say uh, just don't sweat the small stuff. Right. So that would be the first thing I would say, um, you know, um, if you just listen to what your client wants, it makes the whole process a lot easier than mm-hmm. trying to sell something to a client who isn't interested in whatever it is, whatever your idea that isn't what they say to um, minimize communication between people by giving a lot of people autonomy and having them in the room mm-hmm. so that there isn't, you know, things aren't missed and there isn't a lot of times for communication. Um, you know, I think at times, um, you know, you can think about, um, as I said at the outset, I build models and you'd say, well, my billable rate, it doesn't really pay for me to be building a model. You know, I should have a model maker doing it. Um, but at the same time, I have someone who might be considered a model maker who's sitting in a meeting making decisions that's probably above their level. So overall, it kind of evens out in a way. Yeah. And I think that, um, I just think that having independent, like-minded people is a pretty efficient uh, business model. And if I don't split the small stuff, I think that um, I would say that we don't look necessarily at every project making money, but overall. So some projects do better than others, of course. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is a rough strategy in terms of, um, you know, how you might, like smaller projects are obviously more difficult to make money on than larger projects. So in some ways, the larger projects support the smaller projects. Right. Um, they kind of, they kind of have to. So I kind of look at it overall, just look at it as a one broad thing, not trying to make sure that, um, you know, that, that every project at every phase, you know, has to, has to make money. It's, it's just, it's, much more of a holistic view. <laughs> it's a holistic view. I think you just try to do everything as effectively and quickly as you can. And in yeah. the end, it works out. If everyone has that mindset, it just, it kind of works out. You know? <laughs> Love it. I don't know. It's, yeah. I mean, I, we just, there aren't a lot of, there aren't a lot of, um, uh, you know, checks and balances from a financial standpoint, if you will. Just, right. There's a lot of trust. I would say trust is also, I mean, think about this is the trust economy, right? You got Uber yeah. and, and Airbnb and, um, and all those companies are profitable because of trust because people trust each other. Yeah. So I would say that's, you know, not trust. That's expensive not to trust people. <laughs> so I would say trust is another, another big thing. How, how is the business structured internally? So in terms of the leadership team and the kind of, or like the, the hierarchy, if you like, if you like, what does that, what does that look like? If any, uh, there's not, I mean, there's the, we have, there's four principles and, right. um, we have a, we, um, we're all kind of like-minded. So, um, you know, there's, we're, we don't, it's not like we have to get together and direct things. And so, and then, um, then we have um, essentially project teams of which one of the four principles is usually leading um, and kind of setting the general direction and maybe probably being the main contact with the client at the highest levels. Um, and then, um, and then below that, there's the, I mean, not even below that. I mean, it's just, it's, it's much more collaborators as a team that's working towards, um, you know, 
there's some levels of project architect, but not even project manager per se, you know, it's, it, uh, I don't know how to explain it really, but, um, you know, in our office, I think we're 25, but we have 20 active projects. So many of the projects have just one person, as I mentioned, is handling everything. Right. So, so you have a principal who's checking in with one person, um, you know, once or twice a week in the projects being handled by that one person. So that's, there's not a lot of versus so, so just if there's three projects and you have three people, you could structure it so that there's a project manager, project architect, and a project designer on each of those three projects. Mm. Or you can basically have one person responsible, three people, one each responsible for those three projects, right? Got it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, 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 we're, so much the, we're the second model. Right. Okay. And it's and it's like you were saying earlier that you're you're ensuring that the architects and that your your team are actually having that kind of holistic experience. So they're actually kind right. of they're kind of being cultivated, right. if you like, from concept right the way right. through to, you know, right. handing the keys over, if you like. That's right. That's right. Yep. Brilliant. Um, so how 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 has how has the last the uh, the last year affected the way that the business operates in terms of pandemic? And well, interestingly, so we're, we're a little different than many offices here in the States is that we're all Mac based. Ah. So we don't use Revit. Uh, we use, a, and they'll, they'll love me for saying this, we use a program called Vectorworks. I don't know if yes. you've heard of that. <laughs> I know Vectorworks right. very well. Yeah. My, my so we're all Vectorworks. Um, and, you know, we've, um, we're interested, I've always been interested in, if again, back to the trust issue. Mm. is that um, people don't have to be in the office to be working. And because our off, because a lot of our work was international anyway, um, we, uh, everyone, before the pandemic hit, everyone had a laptop and everyone could work remotely. So our office was set up because we wanted people to be, have the flexibility to work from home and the flexibility to work anywhere in the world. Right, okay. So, so all of that was set up. Pre, pre-pandemic, you were kind of pre-pandemic. Leading, leading the and charge. So, yeah, so the pandemic in terms of everything we had to do for, I mean, Vectorworks is incredibly portable. You know, it works off a, it works off a MacBook Pro. Everyone mm-hmm. had MacBook Pros. Um, you know, we have a, obviously there's a, um, you know, I mean, we just use Dropbox. We have that all set up. So everyone's working, everyone was working remotely. So the only issue we had really was, um, uh, was that we had to, so we upgraded as much as we could. Um, we provided additional, um, I don't know what they're called, the routers or whatever in everyone's homes to in, to help upgrade as much as we could um, everyone's um, uh, internet capability yeah. uh, for communication. That was the one thing that we had to do that was, that, that affected us. Um, but other than that, we were, we were kind of set up to deal with it, honestly. Fantastic. So you've always had that kind of remote working culture, digital culture, if you like, embedded into the business. We did. I mean, this, this really, this really pushed it. I will say that, um, you know, and we have, you know, uh, I mean, we had office meetings each Monday in the office. So we kept those up through zoom. So we, every Monday morning we had a zoom meeting with everyone on zoom. And we actually had a, we had zoom awards, you know, for the, at the end of the year, and then our office party. So, um, you know, just how everyone had handled, you know, how everyone had handled Zoom and did, so there was, everyone got a different Zoom award. So we kind of played up the whole Zoom thing. Um, but uh, I think that it's been a challenge and that um, particularly in our younger staff is really eager to get back into the office because the thing that we've lost is, um, you know, all those kind of informal conversations or overhearing things or just being able to easily ask a question. So I think that it's been, it has been kind of isolating for some people. It's been, it's been hard. Um, we've had, we have families. And so we've also had to have, um, some people have, have had, had to take, you know, time off to, because the, the, their kids are out of school and stuff that we've tried to, that we've tried to deal with. I think our clients have been pretty understanding of that. Mm-hmm. Um, tried to work around that and be as, as accommodating, you know, as we can as an office, I think we have to be, you know, understanding, uh, there. Um, but I think that, when it first happened, we heard some offices that it was difficult to transition, but for us, we were at least from a technological standpoint, we were, we were pretty well prepared. Um, and also began to look at technologies um, that would allow us to even 
with our clients to use um, to use more interactive technologies relative to instead of physical models and going somewhere, being able to do that, you know, um, with different software that um, that you know is compatible with vector works that we've been working on. But yeah, as an office, technically it was okay, but I think culturally it's a challenge. So yeah. For, What's what's next for the rest of 2021? What's next? I mean, relative to the COVID thing or just relative to projects? What's... Just relative to projects and... Yeah, I mean, I think that um, it's interesting. We have, uh, you know, we have several really big projects, um, uh, a, a big project here um, in Massachusetts. Um, and uh, another one in, in Honolulu. So um, I think the focus of this next year is gonna be, um, uh, you know, the effort on those two, those two large projects. Um, also, um, you know, there's a lot of um, clients that we have that are, that are looking forward coming out of this. I think that many schools, as you can imagine, are trying to figure out like what, how do they come out of this thing? What's gonna happen, particularly international schools in terms of you know, our families coming back, what our company's policy is going to be and so forth. Uh, and then um, independent schools, the ones we work for, I think have seen kind of a rise in enrollment in some ways because of the, the more controlled environments that they can provide. So um, they're investigating projects now. Um, that will kind of depend on what's going to happen with the economy in terms of, you know, who can give money to do those, but they're all, they're all, we have several looking at potential projects. So that might be more 2022 than 2021. Yeah. Um, so, um, so, but I, I would say right now, our focus is to just do uh, for these larger projects right, right now is just to come out of those as, as really great projects. So that's, that's our, that's our focus. And actually, so we have photography of projects we finished. So we're going to be making, you know, I mentioned a couple projects in Africa. We have um, a big project in Guadalajara in Mexico, um, uh, a dance studio out in Michigan at, um, at Interlock and they all need photography. So there's probably gonna be a lot of road trips to projects to, you know, to photograph them. So that'll be fun. Amazing, amazing, brilliant. Thank you so much. And that's a perfect place for us to conclude the conversation, but that's been a really deep insight into how Flansburg has, has, has grown, how you guys win work, how you nurture client relationships and also your, your career path. So David, thank you very much for sharing. Hey, thank you very much. This has, been, uh, this has been fun. Excellent. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you Conquer the world. Carpe diem.